Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Ken McCarthy, internet marketing guru. Well, Jim, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's it's great to be uh, online with somebody that I argue with so amicably on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, and it's also great to have another old time internet dude around, someone who's been around since the beginning or before. Uh, in fact, uh, Ken's been around the internet for a long time. He was known for his pioneering work in some of the early movement to commercialize the internet including early experiments with white hat email advertising, contributions to the development of the banner ad, and practical applications of pay-per-click advertising. And believe it or not, he was a visionary and foresaw internet video long before it happened. That all really happened, and I can prove it. I have, I have the documentation. <laughs> yeah, I actually did a little research to confirm some of these claims that I found on the website. As far as I can tell, they're all true. So when did you get on the internet? Well, it's an interesting story. Uh, my wife wrote a cookbook and it was nominated. Well, I, I helped her a little bit and it was nominated for the Julia Child Cookbook Award. This was back in 93 and it was a public vote. So I was trying to find everybody I knew and ever knew asking them to vote for her. And I couldn't find this one guy who I had gone to college with, um, Jim Medol. And someone said, oh, well, we don't know his phone number, but we have his email address. And I kind of knew what an email address was, but I didn't have an email account. So uh, I called a friend in Humboldt County. I used to live in San Francisco. And I said, could you send an email message to this guy? And it turns out uh, he was only living three blocks from me. He had moved all the way from the east as I did and was, was like living in my neighborhood. I didn't know it. So I asked him, what is all this internet stuff? And he filled me in. And then he said, you should get Boardwatch magazine. So I walked up the street and amazingly on Fillmore Street in San Francisco at the time, uh, a, a coffee shop was carrying Boardwatch magazine, Jack Rickard's old magazine. And uh, they were announcing their 1993 convention. So I said, I'll do that. I'll go and see what that's all about. And I went and I was there with hundreds and hundreds of online obsessed people. My first real exposure to that world. I met um, Mark Graham who figured very importantly in my education and in all things internet in those days. And I had this revelation that the world was going to change soon dramatically. And I had a little notebook with my, you know, one of those marble eyes notebooks with, you know, 180 pages or whatever. And by the time I'd finished the four day conference, I'd filled it with ideas. And I said, this is what I'm going to devote myself to for the next couple of years. That's how I got started. Cool. So you're actually a little bit late to the party, 1993. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll disclose this right now. I'm a technical klutz. I was a tech writer. Uh, I did write, apparently, the first manual for an ISDN um, modem for, what was that company that was in San Francisco downtown? They had their... Hayes. Hayes had its high-end, cutting-edge engineering office in San Francisco, and I was a tech writer, and I, I got the assignment contract to go down and write their ISDN manual. So I kind of knew technical things, but I, I never was comfortable with them. And so when my boss said, hey, I want you to get a modem so we can send stuff back and forth, I, I, I refused because <laughs> I didn't want to be intruded upon. So it's just, a, it's funny, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the reality of my technical prowess. That's probably what made you a good internet marketing guy, not one of these guys that was overly enamored of the shiny little objects. Funny you mentioned Hayes. You know, I go back to the early days, 1980, at the source, which was one of the very big, in fact, it was the first consumer online internet service, and uh, I actually worked there. And I met Dennis Hayes at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1981, where he was selling his then revolutionary Apple modems that plugged into the back plane of the Apple. He couldn't sell them at the CES, but he had a little card table. And I then went out and uh, met him in the parking lot, and he sold me a very early version of the DC Hayes Apple modem out of the back of the trunk of his car for $300 cash money. <laughs> That's how we used to do it. I, I, bought, I, I bought a very early CRM, Customer Relations Management Software Program, in 1992 from a guy from the back, from the trunk of his car, literally. 
uh, Mr. Rose, I can't remember his first name, but wow, he was a visionary. Yeah, amazing. You came on board right about the time the internet started to go early, early, early mainstream, 1993. What makes that significant is that's when uh, the Mosaic Web Browser by Mark Andreessen was released by University of, of uh, Illinois. The Illinois, yeah, Illinois, yeah, yep. and CSA, right? And I, I noticed you also uh, know Mark a little bit. Uh, Mark and I became friends when he was CTO at AOL later. Ah, okay. But uh, when I was also, you know, just down the road, we hit it off pretty well. So that was kind of cool. But anyway, uh, that's when the internet became accessible to normal people. Before that, it was character mode only, things like Telnet and Gopher and FTP. You probably didn't have to deal with any of that shit, right? No, I, I actually did. I actually learned that stuff because 93, you know, the browser, I'd seen the Mosaic browser in the summer of 93 in August, but, you know, it was, there was still a lot of, of, of text being used. Um, the, you know, there was another thing that happened around 93, give or take a few months, that was also very important. That was when e internet email became ubiquitous. In other words, all the services finally, by that point, made internet email uh, available to, to this user. So CompuServe, I think, was the very first to do that. Prodigy. And then, of course, all the little bulletin boards, which, which played, I think, a really important unheralded role in, in, in the adoption of onla the online world. Uh, but by 93, pretty much everybody that was on any kind of an online system could mail to anybody else on, on an online system. And that to, to younger people, that may seem like not a big deal, but you have to realize before the internet, online systems were islands. So if you were on CompuServe, you could communicate with people on CompuServe and no one else. Absolutely. The old walled garden, they called it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the source was a walled garden, CompuServe, AOL. You kind of wonder, because I do remember that transition point before I went whole on to the air internet by about 93 or 94, though I've been dabbling on it since 1990. But I had email addresses on things like that. CompuServe, I still remember it. It was 71410.3101 at CompuServe.com, right? Where does that email go? I should send an email to that address, see what happens. And I had a Jim Rudd at AOL.com. It's funny, me and my cousin would always see who could get Jim Rutt first on any service. Uh. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun little game we played. But yeah, that, that, that's right for the audience. Before about 93, there was uh, really a whole series of islands. And also at about that time, 90, in fact, we were doing it in 93, the company I worked at, we were just implementing it. Corporate email was typically on LANs and interconnected LANs. So it only worked within your corporation. So I could send a letter to a coworker, but I couldn't send an email to, you know, a customer even in 1990, say. Right. By 1993, the gateways had been built and it was fairly straightforward to send your internal mail from your mail servers, which were expensive and hard to keep running, out into the internet. It was very interesting. You're very right. That was a, a that was the second important transition phase change, as we would say, in complexity science that occurred in 1993. I'm sorry. I, and I have to say, I, I put on this event in 94, and in, in this fall of 94, and in the summer of 94, I was you know, building up interest for it. And I was amazed at how many people in the Digirati of, of San Francisco, as late as the summer of 1994, did not have email addresses on their business card or email at all. So, so even though even though it was possible for everybody, even people in the business still hadn't it hadn't clicked with them. In fact, you know, if we if we remember Wired magazine, they didn't get hip to the internet until the fall of '94. They didn't sing its praises or see it as a as a as an important initiative. They just sort of sorted something, you know, in, in the mix as opposed to the thing. Um, Yep. And, that, and again, it's important for people who have a historical mindset to remember that. I mean, today it's all so pervasive. It's hard to believe that, you know, not that long ago, really, less than 30 years ago, this stuff was just starting to happen. You know, I had lots of connections into that world because I was a fairly early member of something called The Well, thewell.com. Oh, yeah, of course. Wow. Yeah, and I'm still a member to this day, believe it or not, and it still exists. Do you use it? I do, like I do with Facebook, I typically take long breaks, currently on about a year long break on the well, but I promise some of my well friends I'll be back this month, well.com, the best conversation on the internet, no advertising and no abuse of your privacy. So 
<laughs> and you know that that really was, and, and and I guess still is, but certainly was in its heyday, one of the most amazing salons on the planet. I, I mean, the number of fascinating people that were on the well back in the heyday was incredible. Um, yeah. I was on the well too, or not, not super active. You know, one of my buddies was Jim Warren. We used to communicate a lot. Um, Steve O'Keefe. Uh, yeah. That was a great moment in history, the well, I have to say. Yep. Yeah. And it's still going. And while it's obviously not central like it was in 1991, it is uh, still a very interesting place to hang out. And it's ethical and honorable and you know, high level of discourse, all things we wish we'd saw more of on the internet these days. So we're, you know, we're both here in uh, 93, 94. When did you start to smell economic opportunity? Right away. Right away. Because I was in the direct mail business, which meant I was used to writing huge checks for postage, for printing to mail houses. And the idea that I could send a communication to a customer for essentially free I mean, when, once I grasped that, it, it boggled my mind. And my, my calculation was, if just 10% of my customers get on this email thing, I'll save some money, <laughs> you know, and I'll be able to communicate with that 10% segment more often. That was my initial thought. And then I started thinking about things like FedEx packages, you know, gee, I could just attach a lot of photographs to an email and send it for free and get it there faster than FedEx. So just the simple savings in communication immediately sold me. My only question was, was it going to catch on? And I, and I have to say, when I went to that BBS Con conference in, um, in 93, there was a panel and the, the subject was, can the internet be commercialized? And, and now, it, legally, it was, and, and this is another thing we need to tell younger people or people that don't have the historical perspective, it wasn't legal to use the internet for commercial purposes until, I have the date somewhere here, uh, sometime in 1989. Yeah, 1990, 1989, there's a lot of argument about exactly what you could do when, but that was about the time. Yeah. And so what that did was we had a whole generation of people that were involved in building the internet with the attitude that this is not a commercial space. So when um, NSFN, I guess is their acronym, said, hey, guess what, guys, you can do business now, there were crickets initially. You know, in other words, the culture of wheeling and dealing and buying and selling and promoting didn't exist in the internet culture uh, when the, when the uh, laws were changed. So there was a little bit of a, a gap before people like me showed up and said, okay, how can we make this thing work on a, on a commercial basis? Yeah, and you're right. I was, again, part of those discussions. And you're also right that that very interesting intermezzo between the walled gardens of you know, CompuServe and AOL and the internet, there was this BBS world. And a lot of the early people that got involved on the commercial side of the internet actually came out of the uh, BBS world. Absolutely. I mean, it was, they had the model, you know, subscribers and, you know, providing access to people, providing content to people. So all that, that was the other, that was the other thing that sold me when I went out to that conference in 93 and I saw the passion that these folks had for the online experience. I realized, well, if these people love it, then this is a something that is possible for the nervous systems of other people. You know, in other words, there was probably a time. In fact, I know there was a time when when movies were first invented, and um, it took a while uh, for people to get comfortable going to the movies. There, there's reports of, you know, when the, when the train arrived on the screen, some people would lose it and run out of the, the theater, assuming they were about to be run over. I heard another funny story recently about a uh, Texas, the early days of Texas, and there was some bad guy doing something bad to a damsel in distress. And some guy literally took a six gun out of his pocket and started shooting the screen. So, the, yeah, so, so. You know, you don't know whether a medium is going to catch on or not. You don't know if it's neuronically or neurologically congruent with, with human beings, right? But when I saw the passion that people had for sitting in front of screens and communicating and downloading and, you know, doing all the things they did, I said, well, if, if this little cadre of people is this into it, then it's neurologically uh, congruent for human beings. And if it is, the only barrier is to make this thing fast, easy, and cheap. Exactly. And then everybody's going to be on it. You saw it. You, you made one of those great life insights, and you were right. Well, oddly, oddly enough, we're, I don't know why this is, because 
you know, we've, you know, I don't know how long humanity has been around, but it's a long time. And suddenly in the last 120 years or 150 years, we've become screen watchers. <laughs> you know, first it was the movies, then it was TV. And I just thought, well, this is just another version of screen watching. And apparently we're, again, neurologically congruent to sit in front of screens and watch flickering lights. It, it, you know, it might go all the way back to the campfire. <laughs> yeah, campfire was somebody telling a story, right? Yeah. You know, and the thing's flashing and, you know, you're sort of sitting there looking at it. I never thought of that. Well, I'm going to add that to my, uh, my <laughs> possibly true, uh, but probably not, hypothesis. <laughs> I like that one a lot, actually. I can see it now. Yeah, okay. Uh, before we get into some of the early evolution of the commercial internet, I think it'd be useful for our audience, who are mostly not marketing professionals, to go into the distinction between brand advertising and marketing and direct response. Huh. I expect we talk mostly about direct response, but it might be useful to make that distinction for folks. Very good. You hear the term branding a lot, and, and it certainly is incredibly valuable to possess a successful brand. However, <laughs> building a successful brand is a really, really expensive process. So that, that's one consideration. Uh, some brand advertising is to build the brand, but a, the, the vast majority of brand ad advertising is to maintain the brand. So when you turn the TV on and you see I don't, even, I don't even know if we see Coke and Pepsi commercials anymore. I haven't seen one in a while. But when I, I remember growing up, there'd be Coke and Pepsi commercials all the time. They weren't selling you on the idea of soda or the idea of Coke or the idea of Pepsi. They were just reminding you so that when you were in the store and had the choice to make, you had the Pepsi theme running through your mind so you'd grab Pepsi. To me, that's an example of brand advertising. It's saturation, it's expensive, it's unmeasurable to a certain degree. And, and the whole point is just to get you when you're in the store, looking at the shelf to remember that, oh yeah, Pepsi's the thing or whatever the, the, uh, the slogan was. Direct response is a whole nother kettle of fish. It grew out of the catalog world of the 19th century. It's measurable. That's its most important feature. You, you run an ad, you know exactly how much the ad run cost, you know exactly where it appeared. And because you can key the ad, which is, you know, change the order form slightly so that it's unique to that particular ad and that placement, you know exactly how many dollars you made back. That's, that's how closely they measure things. And that allows a small business small being, you know, less than $10 million a year to go out there and start selling, you know, actually book transactions, you know, and it's a very, very simple model, dollars in, dollars out. I spend so much money on, on the ad. I got this many orders. Uh, usually you do a little calculation. You think, well, I, I, I realize I may not make a full profit on the first order, but this is a repeat sale. So there's a lifetime value to the customer. So yes, I can keep running these ads. So an infomercial is sort of a classic example of a, of a uh, direct response ad. It's a long one. It's long form. They put down their money. They buy the time. They produce the commercial, and they run it as long as the phone rings. And the phone rings profitably. They will run that infomercial forever. The day it stops being profitable, they stop running it and try to come up with the next thing. So I'm from the direct response world, which is we measure everything because we don't have the budget of Coke or Pepsi. So that's the difference between brand advertising, in my mind, and and direct response advertising. Yep, that makes perfect sense. And you know, I was also involved in some businesses that generate a surprising amount of dead trees back in the paper-based direct response modeling world. And you're absolutely right. The, the whole business was about capturing enough information to run the numbers to see if what part of the matrix you were marketing to worked, ramp up your dollars there and ramp down your dollars elsewhere. And hopefully you'd make a winner out of it. Exactly. So, and we both know what I at least once we figured out how to do it, what a revolution the internet was. So tell me about the very first thing you tried to do commercially on the internet. Wow, let me think. Um, I, mean, one, I mean, one of the things was promoting my events because I was putting on conferences in the Bay Area. Believe it or not, <laughs> it was very hard to convince people in the multi, then called the multimedia industry, who were the digerati of San Francisco at the time. And it was very hard to convince people in the software industry, just in the mainstream software industry, that the internet offered any promise whatsoever. And, um, you know, CD-ROMs, uh, everyone, you know, 
they're, they're ubiquitous now. They're no big deal. Uh, we probably don't even use them anymore because we have the internet. But there was a period before CD-ROMs were commercial items. And so you had this whole industry of people in San Francisco that were custom making multimedia presentations. So, you know, IBM needed some kind of a sales thing. So these guys would create these laser disc type things to that the salesman could either, you know, bring on the road or they could show at conferences. So there was a big solid infrastructure of San Francisco of people that could make multimedia interactive communications, right? They did not for the for the most part, well, not, it's not fair to say half of them, fully half of them, did not get that the internet was going to be important to their futures as late as the summer of 1994, right? And, and you know, one of the things they would tell me is like, well, I I can't stream my multimedia over the internet. The bandwidth's too small. So why would I even want to get involved in this? And I just would, you know, slap my forehead. It's like, guy, ah, can't you see this is coming? It's like, it's so obvious. I'm not a technical guy, but my thought was, all right, it's slow now, but I see these modems are getting faster every season. I think the technical guys can figure out how to make them even faster, <laughs> right? I mean, it is, like I, I always think of like, well, they laid a, a cable from England to the United States on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. If they did that, they can make you know modems move faster, right? <laughs> I mean, how hard could it be? I didn't think it was going to happen overnight, but I saw it coming. So that was my my first businesses. Besides helping people, you know, do little things, we we had a hosting company. We would build websites for people. But my main business from '94 till 2011 was teaching business people how to use this thing effectively. So my first business ventures in the internet world were bringing the then internet commercialization experts together uh, for audiences and trying to explain, guys, this is what's coming. This is how it works. This is how you might use it. Very interesting. Did you try to promote your own businesses other than how to teach? You know, it almost seems recursive here. I'm using internet marketing to market to people to teach them internet marketing. Uh, did you ever use it for any for something with more like real bullets, like actually sell a product or service? Well, I've got a couple of websites that I run now that kind of fit, fit that model. Uh, one is called Jazz on the Tube, and it's a service for people that love jazz. And every day we put out a, an email pointing them to a jazz video we found, and then we run advertising. Uh, what else do we do? We get we solicit support because jazz fans are really into what they're into, and they're willing to support the thing above and beyond. You know, it's a free service, but sometimes we say, hey, kick in some money, and lo and behold, they do. Um, yeah, I sold my conferences online. But interestingly enough, in 94, you couldn't sell the conferences online because there weren't enough people online to make it really work. So I had to do the selling the old-fashioned way. I had to go to, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce meetings. I had to, you know, make alliances with with trade associations and mail to their mailing lists. So my original efforts to promote the internet were mostly done offline, the old-fashioned way. Yeah, and remember that's you know that was what we all had to do because as you said you can't sell uh, to get people online online. I mean the most famous example of that was the AOL CD-ROM bombing of the world. I mean right, literally billions of CD-ROMs that they drop all over the United States and Europe to get early adopters on AOL. Right, and that was kind of a direct mail play or direct marketing play for sure. And they had, I'm, I assume they did the calculation that if we mail X thousands of discs, we'll get X hundreds of new subscribers. Each subscriber will be worth X <laughs> and it will all work out in the end. I happened to meet the woman who actually came up with the idea for that campaign. And she said, yep, they did some back of the envelope simple calculations, but frankly, they were so desperate to find something to crack this conundrum that they just punted and went for it. Yep. Committed a fair amount of money. They did not do what you and I would have done as our own startup entrepreneurs. They bumped a shitload into the first shot and it did fortunately work. Then they got serious about, you know, hardcore direct response marketing metrics. Yeah. So that, that you know, for a long time, I mean, I don't remember, when did the AOL bombing occur? I mean, look that up here online. During the 90s. You know, it might even be a little for sure than that even, CD-ROM. Well, I, I mean, I remember AOL being so small that I could write Steve Case and he'd write me back. Yep, yep. And, and they were pretty small in the early 90s. Here it says between 93 and 2006, AOL sent out more than a billion CD-ROM. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, my God. We were both right. It was in the 90s and early double R, but as late as 2003, they were still uh, doing the world. It used to be a kind of a pop culture stunt to see what kind of cool things you could do. One friend of mine took all the CD-ROMs he'd received from AOL and turned them into ornaments for his Christmas tree. There you go. Yeah, I knew somebody else who turned them into coasters. And whenever he you know, had guests over, he'd hang out, hand out AOL CD-ROMs with uh, little rubber feet glued onto them. So it was kind of interesting. Now, the other thing you talked about, and this is something I was tracking always, was the transition on what is it feasible to do online based on bandwidth, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. In the earliest days, say 1981, text was all you could do basically, right? Yep. Then it was images in the mid 80s. And then it was audio, which you could do on a store and forward basis, but not real time in the later 80s. And then it was real time audio in the very early 90s. Then it was downloadable video or forget this little era where you, people would want to watch a movie. Typically, you'd get it for free from some pirate site, but it might take 12 hours to <laughs> One hour movie. That's right. Yeah, you know, the earliest days of those pirate video sites were all non real time. And then finally, you know, streaming video finally came on. And remember, it wasn't that long ago that Netflix was in the business of sending out CD ROMs. Yeah. Remember that? I do. And I will give them credit, uh, amazing credit, huge balls, right? Because they, they knew that the real play was streaming video, but they decided to preempt that marketplace. They would invest a bazillion dollars in owning the CD-ROM mailing back and forth business, which was an insane business to be in, could never possibly make any money. You know, I don't know how much they raised, but it was a shitload to dominate that business. And there was a period when Wall Street thought they were nuts and the transition wasn't going to happen fast enough for it to all work and their stock price collapsed. I mean, to a really low level. If anybody bought Netflix stock then, they would have made a pile of dough, but they were right. And they rode that transition and now they're probably the dominant entertainment company in the world, or at least number two behind Disney. Which is amazing, you know, considering how how young a company they really are. I know I remember the Netflix uh, physical business was so big that in my little village where I live, the post office decided to devote an entire window just to Netflix returns. That's I mean not not a window, but a, a slot. They had a Netflix slot because the, the volume was incredible when that thing was going. Yeah, and they they acquired the customers and then when we all went online, they had us. Now, here's something that's going to blow my, it blew my mind. It's going to blow our audience's mind too. Netflix didn't launch its streaming business until 2010. Wow. So it's only nine years old. And already we have cultural memes like Netflix and chill, man, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's only nine years old. That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I would have said it was older than that, but nope, that's what Wikipedia said. And we know they're not allowed to lie on Wikipedia, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know there's a page, speaking of Wikipedia, do you know there's a page on Wikipedia itself that states, do not believe anything you see on Wikipedia and do not even use Wikipedia as a source about information about Wikipedia? We're so unreliable. It's on there. So it, it, it's very, very funny. Of course, there's been uh, some tests done in the last five years that show that on average, Wikipedia is more accurate than Encyclopedia Britannica. Really? Yep. And it makes sense because it's updated in real time. It's cross-checked. Now, of course, it does not apply to highly controversial topics. <laughs> to say the least. You, you type Hillary Clinton or look at the article on Gaza Strip or something. And those things are edited hundreds of times a day in a bad faith, horrible kind of fashion. Yeah, it's a shame because you're right. When they're on, they're really on, you know, Wikipedia, especially on the science stuff and the chemistry stuff and the biology stuff. Oh, my God. And history stuff, too. Amazing, right? Obscure little battles that no normal military history buff. And, you know, that, yeah, you could chase down some monograph someplace uh, that cost you $100 for an out of print monograph, or you can read an amazing, uh, quite detailed article about it. Uh, true. And, and uh, I love jazz, and so I'm interested in all the history, the historical information about the history of jazz and the musicians. And incredible, just incredible. Yeah. Well, back to the actual doing stuff, you know, that your your clients who you were teaching direct mail stuff to, what were they doing in the early days? Oh, everything under the sun. Um, I'll give you an example. This is one of my favorite stories. He, his name is uh, Lloyd Irvin, and he was a 
is a martial arts person. He won a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world title twice. You know, really high-level guy. He trains a lot of MMA fighters now. And he decided to take his knowledge and systematize it and package it and make it available via the internet. Uh, this was back in uh, 2003. And he went out and built a really huge business for himself. You know, a lot of these guys in, in that industry, you know, they make money from their bouts and they make money from training, but it's kind of short money at the end of the day. And you can only fight so long <laughs> and then you you know you just can't take the, the bang, bang ups anymore. Uh, and they end up in not very good financial positions. So here's a guy who's, he's got multiple businesses now uh, online because once he figured out how to do it for MMA or, or for martial arts, he learned the formula, which is find a hungry market, which is very important, come up with good offers for the market and put ads in front of them and make sure the ads pay out. So he's doing very well. I had another student who, there was a lot of weird businesses, wedding party favors, which you'd think, well, what kind of a business is that? And the reality is everybody that gets married and has any kind of a reception gets wedding party favors. So they were bringing over their own container loads of custom made things from China uh, that they, you know, with huge markups, of course, and they did all that marketing via the internet. Then my website, Jazz on the Tube, I compete head to head very well with, with uh, Jazz Times, which is, you know, in the jazz world, a fairly large organization with dozens of employees, and Downbeat, another largish organization for my industry with dozens of employees and decades of, of track record. Well, when it comes to to uh, web traffic, you know, sometimes I'm ahead of Jazz Times. I'm always ahead of Downbeat. So th- those are some examples. We're mostly mostly selling information, though. The wedding party favors is an example of somebody selling physical, and that business got to twenty million a year. Believe it or not. I mean, I, f- I find it hard to believe myself, but a lot of people get married. Yeah, and the uh, poor dads that are paying the bills <laughs> <laughs> aren't necessarily uh, utterly price sensitive either, right? <laughs> do, do you have some daughters in, in, in that category? I have one daughter, fortunately, successfully and happily married off five years ago. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and lighter ever since, right? But hey, that's uh, it was well worth it. It was a wonderful event. Uh, But I do notice that uh, you point to the fact that high net margin businesses are easier to direct response market. Oh, it's essential. Yeah, it's essential. In every business, really, (laughs) if you can get away with it, you really need those high margins. There's there's a lot of bills to pay. And as a civilian, you look at the the margins and think, well, that's unfair. How can you charge 10 times what it costs you to make? Well, because I've got inventory and warehouses and employees and advertising and utilities and insurance and all the things that go wrong. I need that eight to 10 time margin. Yeah, at least six. Uh, 60% gross margin is the lowest I'll look at typically. But I do love that 90% gross margin, which is typical of a mature software business. And for an online information business, it might be closer to 95 Yeah. And uh, my conference business definitely was, you know, very high up there in in, in that. Yeah. Information is a great product. Uh, The price is elastic. You know, what's good information worth to somebody who really, really wants it? And what does it cost to produce? Well, there's the research, of course, but once the research is done, the actual form is trivial, even when you're printing books and sending books. I was in the publishing business, first in books and then in online most of my career. And I used to say something at, you know, industry meetings and company conferences and stuff, which I'm sure they'd put me in HR prison if I said today, which is I I used to say, the information business is like the prostitution business. (laughs) You got it, you sell it, and you still got it. (laughs) Yeah, we probably can't say stuff like that anymore. Well, fortunately, we can't say it on podcasts. Fuck them if they don't like it. They <laughs> yeah, fuck, fuck them if they can't take a joke. You know, that's about why I love podcasts. You know, it's part of the emergent radical media fringe that's under nobody's thumb, no gatekeepers, which is uh, amazing. It really is a beautiful thing. You know, how many great voices and interesting people are doing stuff that would have been absolutely financially unsupportable pre-internet. I mean, more than we can even imagine, you know, for every hobby, for every interest, you know, there's, there's at least one guru who's doing great and probably a dozen of them doing really 
specialized media that just otherwise wouldn't be supportable. So that's one of the beautiful, that's one of the things I saw right away because I was, I was a, you know, somebody that loved information and, and loved publishing. I had a business before the internet, which was really a money-making business, but I, I was putting on conferences for people in, in the real estate finance industry. And I just, from that experience, and before that, I had a business teaching speed reading and study skills to college students, which I loved doing. And you know, it was hard to make, you know, we made money, but it was hard to make a living pre-internet because uh, you were sort of constrained by, you know, print and ink uh, and geography in, in to, to a degree. But the beautiful thing about the internet is open. You, the whole planet can be a customer potentially. And so I can have customers from Singapore and from Finland and from Bolivia and from Japan and that otherwise I never could have reached, you know, Talk about you know brand awareness. I mean, how, how do you reach somebody in Japan from the United States if you don't have the internet? It's it's never going to happen. Yeah, it is quite remarkable. In fact, one of the uh, surprises to me in my little podcast venture here is only about fifty percent of my listenership is from the United States. The other fifty percent scattered all over the world. I mean, unbelievable. Malawi, Cambodia. There's a few. And there are, so, I think there's four or five countries that actually have higher per capita listenership. I actually pulled my listenership data by country and cross-referenced it the country population that have a higher per capita listenership than the U.S., Australia being number one. Wow. And one of them was a non-English speaking country. Sweden did about 12% better per capita of listeners to my podcast than the USA. And <laughs> it's amazing to me, right? To your point, that the internet just gives us the ability to address the whole world for very, very, very little money. Yeah. And this is something that's so easy to take for granted and and forget. But you know, you and I both remember what it was like before and it was... You couldn't do things like this. Absolutely. Well, this has been a bunch of great background. Let's switch now to the Nidai Gridai. We got ourselves a marketing guru. Let's have him guruize a little bit. <laughs> As I was looking through your books, one of the things that, I, that caught me first was you called it your secret, the secret, the only thing you really need to know. <laughs> you know the battle is won or lost on day one when you pick your market. Successful marketing is not so much about what you market or how you market it, as it is about who you market it to. Tell us about that. Well, I think it's it's so important. You know, different markets have different levels of responsiveness and different levels of financial potential. This is an example I use a lot, uh, taking two different sports, tennis uh, and golf. You don't see a lot of direct response people going into the business of selling stuff to tennis players, and, and it's worth thinking about why that is. Well, tennis players have one racket. Maybe they'll get a new one every now and then, but they tend to like a particular racket. They might buy a bunch of them so that they have, you know, if they're serious players, they have they can replace them quickly. Uh, they get their rackets restrung, and they have to buy cans of tennis balls, and that's pretty much it. Now, golfers, on the other hand. You know, they need the new draw. I don't golf, but I, I was a caddy for two years as a kid, and I, I observed this firsthand. They need the new driver. They need the magic putter. They need the, you know, magic golf balls. They need to learn the new improvement on their swing. They, they, there's just a million and one things that, that for some reason, the golfing community uh, is willing to spend money on. So if somebody went into business thinking they could make a living selling to tennis players, they've got a tough road. If they're going into business trying to sell to golfers, it's actually almost laughably easy. I had a friend that was selling via the internet special vitamins specifically. I mean, this was ludicrous, but it actually made some money. Special vitamins formulated to the needs of golfers. You know, just crazy, but there, you know, a buyer is a buyer is a buyer. So if you're going to go into a business, you're kind of looking for pockets of people who are buyers. And I know that sounds ridiculously simple, but I'll give you another example that might help. I had a student also in the martial arts arena. He had been a college wrestler, pretty good college wrestler. He wrestled for Nebraska. He wrote the ultimate book on how to be a successful college wrestler. <laughs> and it died on the vine, you know? And the reason was college wrestlers are not buyers. They go to their workouts. They listen to what the coach says. They're not buying books and courses and tapes and going to conferences on how to be a better college wrestler. It's all a self-contained unit. So he, he had a brilliant idea and it's made him 
you know, definitely deep in the eight figures at this point. He was selling, sells martial arts stuff. He just transferred his wrestling knowledge to the broader world of martial arts. Now, people that are into martial arts are kind of lunatics. You know, if you're really into it, you, you know, you learn how to punch, then you have to learn how to block. And then you learn that, then you have to learn a punch that overcomes that block. And you have to learn how to kick. Then you have to learn how to, a new kick that evades that kick. Then you have to learn how to fight with knives because someone might come with a knife. Then you have to learn, you know, gun disarmament. Then you have to learn, oh, that's no good. Now you have to learn ground fighting. Well, that's not very good. Now you have to learn the new ground fighting. You know, it's just, it's endless. And if you see magazines like Black Belt, for example, which you could probably see it, Barnes and Nobles on the, if they're, if it's politically correct to sell that magazine in public anymore, you'll see it's loaded with direct response ads. Why? Because they are ravenous buyers a, and, and a buy, and you get, you get that first sale. And if you don't screw it up, you'll get many, many more opportunities to sell them more and more and more and more, thus building up the lifetime value of the customer, thus raising the amount of money that you're able to spend on advertising, which we talked about earlier in the call, which is it's all numbers in numbers out. So, so picking your picking your market is so important. And I, can I go on to a riff on this because if you look at Facebook, <laughs> what if how did Facebook start? Facebook, and there, you know there was no grand scheme. It, it, and by the way, this is I think very important for everybody listening who who who's wants to do something in life. Chances are, when you're doing the best work that you've that you're ever going to do in your life. As you're doing it, you're going to have the feeling that you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what's going on and you're not sure where it's going to lead. And it's only in retrospect that you're going to look back and go, wow, that was brilliant. <laughs> you know, that, that's been my experience in life. You know, you find something you're interested in, you love it, you give it your all. It, for some reason, it captures your imagination. You, you're as practical as you possibly can be while you're doing all that, but you just dive in. So what was Facebook? Well, Facebook was, well, we had Facebooks in college. Most private colleges published a physical Facebook, literally, because the young guys aren't going to know this, but <laughs> you'd arrive as a freshman and they'd give you a book and it had a picture of everybody in your class with a little where they went to school, what clubs they were a member of and where they were from. So all that Facebook was, was making that electronic. That was a ravenous market. You knew because of, and I remember as a college student, I, I was reading that Facebook every night, you know, checking out the girls, seeing, I wonder if I can meet this one. So you already knew that there was a ravenous consumption for Facebook type information, right? So that was an accidental backing into an amazing market. And then, you know, once, once he got Harvard online, you know, he realized, well, my God, I'm in the in the nexus, as you as you know, right? Boston, Cambridge. I mean, <laughs> you throw a rock and you're going to hit 20 schools. So he immediately networked all of Boston, Cambridge, that whole area, and then it was just a logical leap to go to all the other universities in the United States. And I have a video somewhere in my archive of him saying, "We just want to do colleges, and we're done." <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. So, but 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 he lucked on to a ravenous marketplace. Now, if he'd gone into, you know, creating an online resource for tax attorneys, uh, we might never have heard of him. That's the kind of business we had Thompson. We had a $400 million business selling information to tax attorneys and tax practitioners. How about that? But it took, uh, you know, decades of hard work to build that business. It certainly didn't explode. Exactly. You know, this is, a, I think, an important marketing story, too. You know, when, when, when Wozniak and Jobs created the, you know, their first computer kit. It was Wozniak that made the business decision. I don't think people realize that initially, right? Then Jobs, you know, took took it the rest of the 99 yards. But that first yard was Wozniak and his calculation was beautifully, elegantly perfect. He said, let's see, there's 50,000 ham radio operators in the United States. That means there's at least 50,000 guys that are nutty enough to buy a kit to make their own computer, we can probably make a few bucks doing this. <laughs> yeah, right. No, that's exactly the kind of thing he would have said. Yeah, and he was, and he, and he was, he was right. There was him using that principle of, "Hey, there's a ravenous market." You know, it's not like, "Oh, I have a product. I think it's great." No, that's not it. <laughs> you you look for a pocket of people who are really into something and you supply them. I, you know, that seem, might seem overly simplistic, but trust me, I'm, I, I just turned 60 and uh, 
I've done this a while and I've seen thousands of success stories and many, many more are not success stories. And it always seems to boil down, find the hungry market and serve it. Don't come up with the newest amazing thing and try to ram it down the market's throat. That's great advice. Another bit of advice you had, probably a little less relevant now, actually, because the internet makes it so easy. But back in the paper direct response days, one that we used to pay a lot of attention to, you you described as you must be able to easily reach your market. We used to rule out products based on what we called the needle in a haystack problem. Yeah, there's a million people that would buy the product, but there's no way to distinguish that million from the 300 million in the country. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, again, it's just logic. And strangely enough, this, you know, there's a lot of fantasy in, in business thinking <laughs> and not just among civilians or amateurs. And there's this idea, if I have the great product, you know, the world's going to be the path to my door. There's also the fantasy, oh, if I write the great ad, the world is going to be the path to my door. And it's, yeah, it's good to have a good ad, but you also need to be able to put that ad in front of the people who are going to care and do it economically. And, and I don't mean inexpensively, I just mean economically in the sense of dollars in, dollars out. So if you can't clearly figure out how you're going to put your message or your product or your offer or whatever it is in front of the right people, you don't have a business opportunity. You have a, you know, an, an idea and, you know, ideas, as they say, are a dime a dozen. Uh, so, you know, the internet hasn't, necessarily solve the problem. You still have to figure out, okay, where are the people? I mean, it's a little bit easier, but you know, where are the people who are going to be interested in this offer? And sometimes it's curious. Like for instance, my podcast, I do a small amount of promotion so far, just experimental to understand the shape of the field. But I initially started doing just some regular small scale Facebook advertising. It didn't work at all. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, why is that? And I said, you dumb idiot. You should have realized this before you spent your $50, which is that only a relatively small minority of people listen to podcasts, right? So yep, yep. if you say, all right, give me everybody in the state of Virginia, some random sample of them and, and uh, push them to my podcast, most of them say, I don't give a shit about podcasts. And even if they do accidentally click on it, I go, I'm not interested in podcasts, fuck this, right? And so it, it actually turned out to be quite tricky to figure out how to zero in on people who actually do listen to podcasts. And it took me you know, several iterations, and I think this year I'm going to push a little stronger on marketing now that I have figured out there is a way to find a concentrated enough market of podcast listeners. But a naive approach didn't work at all. It was off by a factor of five, and uh, it takes, took some incremental experimentation to find out what worked. You know, I have a, a, a friend, he, sadly, he passed away uh, two summers ago, James Martell, and he had, as far as he could tell, the longest continuously running podcast on the internet. Not, not the original one, because the original one discontinued, but the longest running one. And he came up with a few gems. One, of course, is get on as many rel a related podcasts as a guest as you possibly can. That's just the golden method. Yeah, I've done a bit of that, uh, like six or seven, and I'm going to do more this year. And he's absolutely right. It's, and it's cheap, right? An hour's worth of your time, and you reach you know thousands of people. And every person you reach is qualified on at least one level. You know they're a podcast listener. Yep. And, and interesting, you know, that, that's, that, that raises an interesting subject. If somebody's doing a direct mail campaign, and let's say they're selling, I'm um, looking around my office for something relevant. I'm going to say they're selling CD. I believe it or not, I have a CD player in my office still. They're selling CD players. What's the most important thing to have if you're, if you're going after a, a list of prospects for CD players? Well, one, of course, is that they are interested in CD players. But there's another element which is absolutely essential, which is that they are a known mail order buyer. Right. So in other words, it's not just enough that somebody's in, in the direct response world. It's not just enough that somebody's interested in the product category. That's that's good. You need that. It's sort of a fundamental. But you also have to blend in the element that this person at some time in their history, hopefully a lot, has made mail order purchases before. So when you go to, let's say, to a list broker, uh, someone that you say, hey, I got this thing, I want to sell it. Do you have lists of people that love music? Okay, here's people that love music. Now I want a responsive list. I want a list of people that have bought via this channel 
before. So when you're a, a guest on a podcast, the great thing is you know that 100% of the people you're in front of are podcast users, right? So that, that's really good. The other thing that, that he taught me that's so obvious and <laughs> it didn't occur to me is that people search People that are into podcasts and are doing searches on particular topics search for things. And you want to make sure that you have a really good and detailed description of your show with just the kind of keywords that, you, that we used to put on um, pages on the web to make sure that they were findable by a, a you know, search engine. And, and that turns out to be you know, pretty important thing. So put as many buzzwords and related words as you can in each description of the show. And then the other thing he said is use every conceivable syndication service out there. They cost nothing, at least currently. And, you know, some people are going to want to listen via this syndication service. Some people are going to listen to that. So you might as well make yourself available to, to every possible person. So those were, those were his secrets. And oh, the other thing too, at the beginning of the show, at the ending of the show, asking people for their email addresses and encouraging them to share the show, you know, be, being religious about that. He was emphatic about that. Yeah, I must have been. I have not, I have not done that last one. The other ones I am doing, I, I probably should. The other one I hear very successful podcasters do is ask for five-star ratings on their podcast apps. Yep. I haven't done that either. I used to be a shameless promoter. Never used to never be uh, unwilling to do such thing, but so far I've been a little, uh, a little shy on this podcast. Maybe that'd be what part of my 2020 marketing campaigns get a little stronger about asking people who love this, my thing. I've got, you know, all five star ratings pretty much. And everybody tells me they like it. I don't know. They don't seem to be lying and numbers keep growing. So maybe I should start asking people to do more to help promote it. That's actually a great idea. And that's one thing you, you, you know, you learn from direct mail is, you know, ask, ask, ask. Uh, I remember this really simple experiment that was done. They, they were trying to persuade college students to get the flu shot, right? So one version of the ad gave all the reasons why it's a good idea or why the people providing it thought it was a good idea. And the other version did the same thing, but it showed a map of where the clinic was <laughs> and how to get there, right? And just adding that little bit of concrete how-to information, that that explicit direction, uh, you know, boosted the response, you know, enormously. So little things can make a huge difference, like just saying, hey, you know, give us a you know, if you, if you enjoyed it, give us a five-star rating or give us the rating you think we're worth. Tell your friends. You might have a friend that li likes this kind of stuff, you know. You know, my, my jazz site, you know, it fluctuates a lot. I'm gonna, I am haven't looked at the numbers recently, but it's, it goes, bangs between 30 and 40,000 subscribers, email subscribers, right? I have never advertised it. Now, I had the advantage of starting when video on the internet was brand new, and that's our, our main thing is we have thousands and thousands of classic jazz videos. So I got a bit of a run up that way by being early, but still, I, I we grow by the thing being passed hand to hand, and that makes sense in a, in a, in a networked world like the jazz world. You know, people have their jazz buddies, they go out and hear things, you know, music together. Um, they, they hang out on various online sites. So there's quite a bit of natural sharing. So I've built that entire business with, with no advertising. That's amazing. And uh, being there first, of course, helps. But then you also have to have good execution, which you must have, right? If you're still here, low these many years later and, and you know at least tied for number one with some of the big names in the biz. And unlike them, I am focused on getting my users to share the information. So we ask, we say that in every email, you know, and they don't do that. They just, they, they're very corporate, you know, they're very buttoned up and everything's very proper. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to a degree to shamelessly beg. <laughs> and I think that's made all the difference for me. Also, I mail every day. Now that takes a lot of work. And some people might say, well, gee, that's kind of excessive. People are going to be disgusted, at, you know, getting email every day. And the answer to that for me is if they're into the subject, they're going to love it and they're going to wish that I mailed 10 times a day. And if they're not into it, well, yeah, they might be annoyed, but that's not my customer anyway. So my, da my daily email, I think, does a lot to, to keep, keep me very competitive with the, uh, the bigger companies. And I have not been too uh, assiduous at collecting emails either. The website allows people to subscribe and they get an automatic announcement. But truthfully, it's uh, not a huge number of people do. Most people that listen to podcasts listen to them on their apps. Mm -hmm. uh, 
on the website. So relatively hard to capture email for a podcast. Well, I'll have to give some thought to it. In fact, I noticed that you had interviewed my friend Ryan Holiday ah. not too long ago. And I was chatting with him, I don't know, about a year and a half ago about something else. And he was just repeating again and again, everything is your mailing list. You know, that is... <laughs> you know, and he's amazing job of creating this empire, <laughs> amazing empire from absolutely nothing of all of his various online properties and personas and what have you. It's the most improbable business in the world. I mean, this is an example of what I was saying earlier. Who could have imagined a young, youngish guy, I don't think he's even 32, making a good living selling stoic philosophy <laughs> to the masses? I mean, that's a, impossible, but he's doing it. And before that, it was book reviews, right? Yeah. Per- takes on books. So he is an amazing guy. I mean, I met him a couple of times. We chatted several times. He's actually my go-to guy if I want to hear, you know, what's the current best thinking about such things. So let me add you to my list. You obviously thought about this stuff a lot too. On the book marketing side, wow, is he a whiz. Holy smokes. In fact, I, uh, I first I ran into him when he had just done the magic that had turned Max Tucker's book into a mega Oh, Wow. <laughs> Quite a book. Was it Welcome to Hell or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And beer. I hope they have be- beer in hell or something. Or something like that. I hope they have beer in hell. I just read the book and then I saw Ryan speak at a conference and I went up, as I will do, and just buttonholed him. We started talking. We just happened to hit it off. So, uh, oh, great. So that- that was kind of cool. Well, let's move on a little bit to uh, you know get a little bit more of the tricks of the of the master here. I was actually quite happy. You know, you think a marketing guru? What kind of cynical piece of shit is this, right? But I have found very little cynicism, at least in your books, right? And I like the fact that when you talked about your copywriting rules, there are no copywriting rules. Knockoffs are for losers, not winners. And in reality, great ad copy comes for passionate caring not BS, hype, and con artistry. That's just great. Yeah, it's it's a weird field that I'm in. Um, you know, there's definitely uh, a segment <laughs> of the direct marketing society that doesn't think that way. But I all I can say is I'm still around and I'm doing well. And a lot of those guys that were smarter than they, you know, than everybody else are gone. I mean, they're literally gone. I don't know where they, they went to, but they're, they're not in business anymore. I think ultimately, I mean, at least from my point of view, Ultimately, you have to be on your customer side. I just don't know how else you could be in business. That's my bottom line, you know. Uh, and I think you can make plenty of money doing it that way. I don't. I never understood these guys, you know, <laughs> that felt that they had to, you know, cut corners and trick people. And um, I don't know. It's not a, maybe a long-term franchise. It might be a way to make a quick buck, strip mine some keyword on Google, but it's not a way to build a, a really cool long-term property like your jazz site. Yeah, and and then they're gone. I mean, I you know when you teach marketing, <laughs> you're going to meet everybody, and uh, I've met everybody, and I can't tell you the number of guys that have gone out and strip mined a marketplace, made a lot of money, and now they're broke and they can't get arrested. Like they just can't, they can't get the next thing because the thing, <laughs> the thing that they were doing was was coming from a, I don't know, in a, a, a pure ex- place of pure exploitation. You know, as opposed to hey, value exchange, and you got to make a money. You have to make money. You have to make a profit. You're, you're entitled to high margins as long as your service is great. But yeah, it's just it's it's just funny how some people just I don't know why I don't know why they do it. I, it still is a mystery. To me. It's like you can make all the money in the world playing it straight, and it's yeah. sustainable too, right? If you build a great business with great customers where there's a value exchange, and that's key, then you've got something that'll keep. You know, providing you an income for a long period of time, as opposed to you know being a strip miner. Okay, I I tried five things, I got lucky once. You know, how how many more am I gonna have to try before I get lucky again? Right, that's really all it is. Well, well, yeah, and I'll give you a great story. And this is this is out of Virginia. This is a guy who had a, another improbable business. He sold the ingredients for making your own fireworks. <laughs> Which to me sounds like a uh, leg- legislative or administrative business from hell. You know, it's like you got to be kidding. You know, I know who this is this is Skywriters from Round Hill, New York, Virginia. Yes, yes, that's the guy. I'm a homemade pyrotechnics guy myself. Oh, all right, all right. I lived five miles from Round Hill. Okay, so so you may may remember at one point he had a, a business, big business necessity. I think he had a 
a warehouse and the warehouse was made of wood and the local, you know, the local government came and said, you can't store this stuff in a wooden warehouse. You need this, this, and this. And it was a much bigger check than he had the ability to write. And he told his customers, guys, I'm in a jam. And so he offered some crazy deal. Uh, give me a thousand dollars and I'll give you two thousand dollars worth of stuff <laughs> later, you know. And uh, because he had treated them so well and because he had been central to their fun, the money flowed. He got all the money he needed. He bought new land. He bought, built a new warehouse. Everything was fine. So you, you can do things like that when you treat your customers well. The funny thing or weird thing or, or thing that seems to contradict this is there seem to be all these big businesses that. I guess you reach a certain size and a certain uh, infiltration uh, into society. You know, you're you just you're so in everybody's business that they can't get rid of you. Because I don't see that happening on the big business side. I see kind of the opposite happening. <laughs> you know, they start out good. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Google. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Facebook to you know. And even AOL, to a degree, they they reshuffle the cards uh, after they've brought everybody on board. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, AOL, I'll never forget, AOL had a model. It was, you paid by the minute. And so AOL didn't, didn't have the resources to create content to keep people on the site. So they recruited lots and lots of content experts and said, look, as long as somebody's on your, in your area, we're going to share revenue with you. And that was a great model. It brought a lot of people in. A lot of people made money. Uh, it was wonderful. And then AOL said, hey, this guy's making a lot of money with that content site. We can hire somebody for a fraction of that and keep all the money. And they would, so they brought all these content producers in and then they booted them off. And I, you know, I understand business is business, but I, you know. I actually invented that business. Oh, really? Yep. I was on the source. It was called user publishing. The source was tiny. We had several tens of thousands of customers and it was by the minute. This had been 1982, I think. And I identified some people that had their own kind of prototype blogs that ran on our software. And I went out to six of them who I thought were the most interesting. And I cut a deal to pay them 17.5% of the revenue they generated as a royalty. And so that was actually the beginning of that old business model. And before I launched it, I got a moral commitment from the uh, president and the CEO that they would never do what AOL later did, which was to try to cut out these guys by doing it in-house. Oh, great. I could see that hazard even then, even when the stakes, when these guys were lucky to get checks for 500 bucks a, a month. But I'll tell you, 500 bucks real money in 1982, would be the equivalent of about $1,500 a month now, was life-changing for these people. They, 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 they long thought that was a, it was a great deal for them. Yeah, and to do something you love, and to you know how how you know how much better can it be? And and sometimes I don't understand certain things, like some of the things that Google does, for example. They make all their money from pretty much straight advertising, like without any super surveillance, you know. And yet they get involved in all these extracurricular surveillance activities, and I don't know. I, I just well, they're doing. To surveillance. I mean, why do you think they give you Gmail for free so they can read your Gmail? That's why they give it to you for free. Which is why I never use Gmail. I thought this is appalling. I don't want. To, I, don't, I don't want. A mach- I don't want anyone, even a machine, to read my email. But their their logic was well. If he's talking about you know fireworks, we'll show him a fireworks ad. There's a logic to that when you're doing searching or when you're on somebody's website and they've made room for Google ads. If it's a again, if it's a fireworks website, why not run a fireworks ad? That makes sense. But some of the other stuff they do. Yeah, I guess, you know, the problem is a public company has to keep growing, has to keep grabbing more and more and more and more. And I think that, you know, that's one of the one of the things that's going wrong, in my opinion, like taking something like YouTube, which I think is the wonder of the age. I think it's one of the most amazing, miraculous things that, that human beings have ever created. But now, you know, you, you, Google YouTube has made a deal with the networks. And they're put, let's sort of putting the screws to a lot of these amateur content makers to make more room for the network content. And it's like, oh, really? You know, you see that also in healthcare. They did a got a seven hundred million dollar plus deal with was it Glaxo or one of these companies. And you know, it's like it's just share health information. And it's like. You, why do you have to go there? Well, they have to go there because they're public and they got to f- keep coming up with newer and newer and newer ways to make more and more money. But I don't know. 
afraid we'll see a lot more of that too, because they were equivocal always when Bryn and Page were running the place, right? Uh, but now those two guys have retired. I'm going to assume, unless I see strong evidence the other side, that the suits will have taken over and Google will be set on an economic maximization setting on its business model. I don't think it ever was before, but I believe it will be going forward. You know, the other one, truly sad to my mind, is Facebook. Yeah. You know, Facebook was so profitable from so early. There was absolutely no reason they had to take that puppy public, right? They could have run a small secondary market in private stock. Goldman Sachs would have been happy to do it so that if people wanted to cash out who worked at Facebook, they could. But Zuck could have done what he said he wanted to do, which was to change the world in a good way by bringing us all together. But instead, he got in the business of hijacking our attention to sell us to advertisers because he had to. Yep. Yep. To keep that stock price up. There's no, I mean, he would have made a personal fortune greater than he or any of his descendants could ever possibly spend. And his most of his top employees, too. But somebody sold him on the idea of going public, and then the whole goddamn thing became a shit show. Yeah, and these these handful of companies, Facebook, one of them, one of them has corralled a huge portion of internet traffic. And the thing that I was hoping wouldn't happen is happening. What I hoped was the internet was going to remain this quirky, <laughs> very specialized. You know, whatever your interests are, you go out and find them and and plug in and and have at it. And small producers would have a chance to thrive. And uh, it's you know we've got the hijacking of attention by, by, you know, a few big players. Um, and here, even more weird thing. I want, I'm curious to see if you've seen this. I'd love to know if you've seen the same pattern. Because of their super powerful network effects, and I think Google and Facebook now own about 70% of all internet advertising in dollars, at least. Mm -hmm. but because they're so dominant, their ads are actually not very obnoxious. You know, they don't pop out at you and flash and all this sort of shit. Mm-hmm. And so, oddly enough, the fact they have these network effects have allowed them not to be quite as abusive of the direct eyeballs as all these other people, even now quite prestigious newspapers and magazines, you know, the fucking Guardian, you know, these pop-up ads, these invisible links that pop you up and take you places you don't want to go. Uh, because these guys are so dominant due to their network effects, everybody else is forced to use the most obnoxious, the most crazed, the most extreme uh, attention-grabbing tricks. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying accelerate, actually, because these guys are dying on the vine. And so they're willing to try anything. At least that, that's so it appears. Yeah. And I, I've been watching that for for a long time, you know, and it's, it's that's going to continue. Yeah. yeah. It is interesting. And uh, the other you know, thing that I remember reading uh, Chris Anderson's book, Free, when it came out way back yonder. In fact, I'm going to look up when that book came up. It was a great, deep book, which convinced me he was right. Free the Radical, The Future of a Radical Price by Chris Anderson. The book was published in 2007, 2008, something like that, where he basically said that for a whole bunch of good psychological, cognitive reasons, free will be paid every time, right? Even if the paid is tiny. But it seems to me that that insight, which everybody has rushed to, is what has destroyed the internet. Because now all they have to build their business model around is attention hijacking and selling ads. You know, for the longest time, as you pointed out, AOL got almost all of its revenue from its hourly fees. In the bulletin board world, it was typically a, a yearly subscription. I had a, a BBS. In fact, it was the first BBS for visual basic programmers. And I charged $99 a year. And I had a deal with Microsoft to put my ad in the first 200,000 Visual Basic compilers. And this, I love to show how the world has changed in scale. This was <laughs> in uh, 1992. Cut a deal with Microsoft to put my little one tiny three by five inch glossy piece of paper in every uh, Visual Basic compiler, 250,000 of them. How much do you think Microsoft charged me for that? Okay, um, I'm just going to guess a CPM of ten bucks. So that'd be twenty five thousand. Put this in front of graduate students and have had estimates of a million. You know, twenty five thousand is getting closer. The the right number four thousand. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. That business worked great, right? You know, it was uh, it was an unbelievable little cash cow. I basically just you know 
prowled the world looking for, you know, free software, free coding bits and pieces and articles and stuff and getting permission to put them online and all you can eat, 99 bucks. And, you know, people who are, you know, doing visual basic professionally thought it was the greatest deal in the world. But anyway, I guess my point is, it seems to me that it was the turn to free around 2007 that has led to the internet becoming much less clear on whether it's a net good or a net bad for society. And um, unfortunately, it's not at all clear to me there's any way back. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, our, our model is always, I mean, there is this, you know, reality that the advertising and, and the thing that catches people's attention and brings you in is is free, even in the old media. Uh, you, you know, you'd read articles, publicity articles about product, that content's free, uh, but it would lead you to a purchase. It would point you to a purchase. And that's always been my model. For instance, if you're an information marketer, you've got something of value to a group of people. Give away all kinds of free good stuff, but you know, have other things like online courses or you know, live conferences or consulting. Using Ryan Holiday as an example, He's selling medallions, believe it or not, which is fascinating to me, with you know important inscriptions from the from the great Stoic philosophers on them to his mailing list. I, I, I assume he's doing it because it works, and it may work very well. So you can have both. Well, let me give you an, this is this example might really be helpful for people. The Super Bowl. You can watch the Super Bowl at home essentially for free. I mean, you're not paying the NFL anything. You've got your cheese doodles and whatever it is you've got and your beer and you're watching the game and it's free. Or you could get in the car and drive to a place that's been, you know, a bar, sports bar that's been licensed to show the game. All right, now you got to buy some drinks. So you got to spend a little money. You got to burn some gas. You could also go to the game itself and maybe you don't have a whole lot of money. So you're sitting way up in the bleachers. Okay. Now you've got, now you've got some money. So now you've got a, a good seat, maybe down on the 50 yard line. Now you've got a humongous amount of money and you're buying a sky box with butlers and caviar and champagne and all that. Is the game any different? It's the same game. It's actually better at home because cameras follow it better. Than- <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. But but essentially, it's the same game. But within any marketplace, there'll be people that want to consume it differently. They're not satisfied with sitting at home. They want to go where the action is at the local bar, or they're ambitious and and they they're not satisfied watching it on TV. They want to be at the Super Bowl, you know, or they've got the resources and they've got a business reason to buy a skybox and bring all their big hitter clients and reward them with a, with the Super Bowl experience. So you can take the same thing and and parse it at different price points for people who want and demand different levels of access. And I think people that want to make money online need to think about that. Everything doesn't have to be free. That's the lazy way out. I mean, it, it, as you point out, it's the race to the bottom. I mean, what kind of a business is everything's free? But free things to bring people in, that makes sense. You know, Miss, remember Mrs. Fields cookies? They were going broke. And then Mrs. Fields went out, or I guess she, her name wasn't really Mrs. Fields, but she went out with a, a tray of cookies in front of the store and started giving them out out of desperation. And that turned out to be the thing that turned the tide for that store. And then it became this big chain of stores. I don't know what happened to them. But here's a little secret. You may not know how, how, they, how they ramp that up. When they go into a shopping mall, they have an agreement with the shopping mall to allow the Mrs. Fields to blow the smell from the cooking area <laughs> to the shopping mall. There you go. And they probably have specialized chemical canisters that are even better <laughs> than the smell of, of the ovens. Uh, who knows, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know that. It would certainly be a, a classic race to the bottom. Well, it turns out it's easier to you know send, you know, big welding tanks full of synthesized, better than real <laughs> chocolate chip cookies to blow out into the, put some pheromones in there uh, grown from, you know, fingernail tissue of Marilyn Monroe or something, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. I mean, and that's kind of a model for the, or for what's happened to the internet. We had, we had good cookies. <laughs> They smelled good naturally. Everybody was happy. And now people are bringing in tanks of, you know, synthesized cookie formula that was developed by mad scientists, you know, for maximum addiction. You know, uh, we, haven't even, we haven't even gotten onto the addiction, the deliberate, you know, creating of addictive uh, of responses on the Internet. But that's kind of that's kind of a model for what, what's happened. And yeah, you're right. How do we go back? 
I don't know. It's going to be hard. I, I spent a fair amount of time thinking about that. You know, here's one little data point. It's going to throw this out to all the wannabe entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about, you know, how, how can I do something really significant to the world? Uh, I've been tracking Facebook's revenue per user for quite a long time, and it's surprisingly low. Mm-hmm. All the revenue Facebook gets has been remarkably consistent, about a dollar ninety to $2 a month per active subscriber. Mm-hmm. $2, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So in theory, if Facebook could get everybody to go to a paid model, $2, right? And to your point, there's always a hierarchy of experience versus price, right? And so there ought to be a hell of a lot of room above the $2. So imagine a specialized Facebook for good faith, honest, and high quality discourse, right? Could that be worth $20 a month? Might be 10 times. But to your point about the Super Bowl, compare the free Super Bowl to the uh, 100000 or maybe it's a million dollar, you know, luxury box Super Bowl, same product, but much higher price. Yeah. Because the cost to deliver Facebook have to be clearly less than $2 a month, probably more like a dollar. That means that there's a nice gross margin for a more bespoke, more ethical, wonderful experience that is not all about using cutting edge cognitive psychology to make you addicted to that little red circle up at the top of the Facebook page. Right. And then, and then sell your personal data to, you know, Merck and uh, JP Morgan. <laughs> Imagine you only got a million people, which is, you know, a thousandth of Facebook's, less than a thousand of Facebook's thing at 20 bucks a month. Hey, guys, that's $240 million a year on a uh, probably 90% gross margin business. Uh, do the math, a business well worth building. Yeah, why not? Why not? I wonder, I, I, I just, I wonder if they're just so enamored of this, we're going to grab all their psychographic information and sell it 10 million different ways. And they just can't let go, you know, sort of like that, that old, that old story of the, the monkey puts his fist in the jar to grab, I don't know what he was grabbing, a cookie, we'll, we'll say. But once he closed his fist around the cookie, his fist was too big to get out of the jar. But he couldn't let go of that cookie, so he couldn't get his hand out of the jar. Which, which leads to this interesting point. At some point, Google and Facebook are going to start being valued by Wall Street as publishers. Right now, they, they get a, they're getting a, still a lot of lift from the fact that they're growing fast and you know they're sp- spinning off lots of revenue. and well, It's the growth. It's the growth that's the thing. But at a certain point, the growth is going to slow down. And then Wall Street's going to go, well, you know, you guys are kind of like Life Magazine. You know, you've, you've got um, eyeballs and you make a certain amount of money from them. And, you know, we don't value publishers at the way we're valuing you super high tech guys. So maybe we're going to start valuing you as as a just a regular old publisher because you're really in the eyeballs for dollars business. Whereas all these years they've they've been in the fast growth taking over the world business, but that will reach a, a limit at a certain point. Uh, then their valuation you know stagnates or goes down, and then all of a sudden you can't keep all those engineers as easily as you could before when the stock price was doubling and tripling you know constantly. I I've heard that analysis from some. From Wall Street people, I don't know if, if, if it's going to play out, but it, there's a certain logic to it. There is. There's another kicker that may actually accelerate it, which is because the margins are so high and it's all advertising, should direct response marketing drop significantly during the next recession, you could see an explosive decompression in the profitability of those companies. You know, they have relatively high fixed costs now, and particularly now that they both want to police the world, which is a <laughs> piss out of me. But you know, imagine that all the random shit that's advertised on Facebook and Google, the demand for that's going to go down a lot if we're in a really serious recession. And truth of the matter is this dominant Facebook Google world did not exist really in the last recession. Mm-hmm. And very interesting to see what happens when the shit inevitably hits the uh, financial and economic fan here in the in the months and or years ahead, whether it will be a kind of reverse ratchet as their revenues drive down, their marginal revenues are where all their profits are. They've built up this cost base and growth slows. And so then you get uh, kind of valuations like a crappy publishing property, like, <laughs> like magazines in their later years, right? Or amazing. Business Week, one of the great properties of all time when I was in my business prime in the 90s, was sold to Bloomberg for a million dollars. I remember that. What a tragedy. <laughs> yeah, 
at Newsweek, I believe, was sold for a dollar to uh, Meredith. Unbelievable. If you told somebody that in the 80s or 90, early 90s that that was going to happen, they would have said impossible. Yeah, in fact, one of my little, uh, strange little riffs was, damn, I wish my dad had left me a Monopoly newspaper, right? <laughs> my dad was actually a cop, so unlikely to have uh, owned a newspaper. That seemed to me like the ultimate thing to own, say, in 1985, would have been a Monopoly big city newspaper, you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, LA Times, something like that. But now, you know, shit, uh, even the Washington Post was sold for relatively pennies on the dollar. Well, you know, Warren, Warren Buffett believed that for the longest time, that local newspapers were the ultimate moneymaker, and, and he was right for that time. And, you, know, you know, another thing about, about ad revenue, and, and this is another advantage of you and me being on the phone because we both go back so far, the dot-com crash, the value of a banner ad, I mean, went from, you know, gold to shit <laughs> very rapidly. Those first couple of years of 2000, you, you could buy every banner ad in the universe for the spare change you had in your pocket. I mean, the inventory was unbelievable. It was just, they couldn't give them away. Yeah, quite literally. It was almost free. In, in 99 and 2000, my company, Network Solutions, was, we believed, the second biggest advertiser on the web. Oh, wow. And it was crazy because we were, at that point, paying good prices because that was the dot-com bubble on the way up. Yep. But you know we were big enough that we bought an ad agency because nobody else really knew how to do this shit. We spent $10 million in building the tracking, automating, and rotational devices to keep our ads fresh. So if you'll remember even things like Yahoo, you could only change your creative once a day, right? Yep. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Yep. But I think we spent probably $70 million in, in web advertising in 99 and $200 million in 2000, which put us behind Ford. It's probably the only company that was spending more on internet advertising at the time. Wow. And I can tell you this, the shit was remarkably profitable because, hell, a domain name in those days, 70 bucks for moving a few pointers in a database, pure fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, now, there's a margin, right? Well, there's a margin for you, people. Fortunately or unfortunately, I actually sold at the top. We sold the company March 10th, 2000, which is as close to the top of the, as the internet bubble as you could possibly find. And so we got the best possible price for it. But the operating environment probably got better in the years ahead as, as you said, the direct response clicks became almost worth nothing there for a couple of years in the years afterwards. Yeah, I have to admit, you know, and, and that's one of the challenges of being early. You know, we, you started in the 80s, early 80s. I, I started in the you know, early-ish 90s. And so by the time 2000 came along, you know, and there's sort of a psychological landmark of 2002. It's like, okay, this is the end of time. Uh, and it's a, weird, it's a weird phenomenon. But clearly, the market's grown quite a bit since 2000. And yeah, there are things that I wish that I'd stayed with uh, that I was doing in 2000. But I, I went in other directions and did other, other fun stuff. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the growth since 2000 has been spectacular. But there was that Death Valley period where, I mean, I went back to San Francisco even as late as 2003, and it was like a neutron bomb had hit the Bay Area. It was one of the few times you could actually buy residential real estate for a reasonable price. Yeah, the buildings were still standing, but the people were gone. Yeah, exactly. Can I tell you the banner ad story? Because, Go ahead, man. Love to hear. all right, so, and this, I think, was this might have been my biggest contribution of all. So it was June of 1994. Which was just a couple, I think a month earlier, had been the 150th anniversary of the demonstration of the telegraph. And I kind of looked at that. I said, wow, 150 years since the telegraph. We've got this internet thing going on. Why don't I put on a little meeting? So I asked Mark Graham, big internet commercialization pioneer. He really should get a lot of credit. Uh, I think in 93, Microtimes called him one of the 100 most important people in computing. He was called Mr. Internet in the Bay Area, which you know, gives you an idea of how central he was to, to helping people get with the idea of commercial internet. So I asked him to come. I asked Mark Fleischman to come. And Mark Fleischman, believe it or not, was the first guy to declare himself a full-time freelance web producer, web designer, you know, web, web maker. Uh, he's the guy that put the Palo Alto Weekly online. That was the first newspaper to put all of his content online. So he goes way back. He, he hung out a shingle in 93. So I had him there. The purpose of this meeting was to sort of brainstorm and figure out how are we going to put a financial financial footing under this thing that we love and are so excited about. So one of the guys I invited to come as a as an outsider was an ad agency, then an ad agency executive named Rick Boyce. And Rick worked for Hal Reine, which was very 
you know, super cool ad agency in San Francisco at the time. May still be, I don't know. But in those days, it was the hippest agency you could work for. And he was a very, very bright guy. And I could see that, you know, he, his mind really was could work. So I asked him to come to the meeting. So we talked about all these different possible models for the, and I have it on tape, thank God. And, and we talked about all these different possible models for commercializing the internet. And we really weren't coming up with anything. So on the break, <laughs> Mark Graham and I were talking with Rick. And Rick had no exposure to the web at all. Like, you know, this was this was June '94. You know, this was there weren't a lot of people on the web. And we said, "Look, Rick, you can put a little square on the page, right? They click on the little square; it takes them to a big square, right? And you can count how many people see the ad and how many people click on the ad. Like, you you can get a sense of how effective an ad is, right?" Two months later, he quit Hal Reine. He went to work for Hotwired, which was Wired's online magazine as the head of business development. And Hotwired was the first business, as far as I know, that put a flag in the ground and said, we are going to be a serious commercial advertising supported website. And Rick Boyce was the first person to sell uh, banner ads uh, on a commercial corporate scale, you know, an industrial scale, you know. So I was there, you know, <laughs> we, we had, and, and I want to say this to, to folks, like we didn't know what we were doing when we were doing it. We were just interested and we had a problem that fascinated us and we were trying to solve it and we didn't know what we were doing, but we thought, what the hell, you know, we we're young, we have a little extra energy, <laughs> you know, why don't we just, you know, I had a whole other business. I was running the, the, uh, the real estate finance conference business and that was a full-time thing. And I was doing all this other internet stuff on the side, you know, but so. I want to encourage young people, like it doesn't have to be, opportunities are not going to be presented to you completely formed. And there's not going to be this clear step one, step two, step three. I mean, Zuckerberg didn't know that Facebook was going to be Facebook when he was putting his college classmates on the web. Uh, Wozniak didn't know Apple was going to be Apple when he calculated that were, there were 50,000 serious techno geek hobbyists in the world that would spend money on chips. You know, if you love something, you know, go for it. You know, you don't know where it's going to take you. And, and so I, know it's, I, I just want to make sure I convey that message. You know, it's not like there was a grand scheme and everybody knew what they were doing from day one. Quite the opposite. Well, I think we're going to wrap up on that note. This has been so much fun, Ken. I am so glad that uh, we got connected and I was able to do this episode. Well, thank you. And I thank our, our mutual friend, Steve O'Keefe, for introducing us. Indeed. Production services and audio editing by Jared Jaynes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.